to put the, this panel in the context into, in, of the, this, year, this year's Medway School. Uh, when we discuss uh, social phenomena of European periphery, um, and here the panel will focus specifically on the area of ex Yugoslavia, then the obvious determining social context is the experience of socialism and its dissolution. Um, and among all other things, we should note the transformative effects of socialism regarding gender relations. Uh, it is, for example, indicative that in Yugoslavia it was only with the advent of socialism that the essential element of formal bourgeois equality, the voting rights, was reached. Um, but perhaps more importantly, with the access to employment and by social, socialization of some reproductive services, women achieved a level of economic independence that was essential presupposition for at least partial escape of traditional gender hierarchies. Now, uh, on the other hand, the consequences of the dissolution of socialism regarding gender equality were, uh, if we were optimistic, ambiguous. Um, on one side, with the failing of the project of universal emancipation, uh, politics based on highlighting injustices incurred to particular elements of society became much more prominent. And in this context, um, at least at the official, most politically correct level, the discourse of women's rights, equal, of equal representation, became quite vocal. Um, but one should not uh, trust the society's narrative of itself. Declarations of gender equality and the fight against more obvious forms of discrimination do not necessarily decisively interfere with the underlying structural changes in the economy. And the phenomenon that accompanied the transition to capitalist economy, such as the erosion of systems of public services, increasing inequalities and unemployment, were not gender neutral. So the purpose of this panel is to trace the actual transformation of the situation of women throughout the experience of socialism and its transition to capitalism in ex Yugoslavia. And in this way, the panel will attempt to bring the politics of gender and class in a productive relation. Um, now I'm passing the floor to the speakers. Um, uh, the first would be Andrea. Uh, Andrea Ivanovic is a postgraduate student at the Faculty of Philosophy at the University of Belgrade. Currently, she's investigating the anti fascist uh, front of women with a focus on its organizational forms. Her uh, uh, theoretical interest uh, covered the critique of political economy, Marxist feminism, and theories of labor and capitalism. Uh, she's a member of the Gerusia Collective and the Center of Social Studies. Uh, so, please, Andrea, yeah, the floor is yours. Uh, the question I would like to start with is why we should deal with that fascist front of women, with just up agenda, we call it that uh, from now on, uh, today in this context and almost 60 years after its suppression. Firstly, I believe that Apogee is an example, even a rare one, of a women's organization that started existing during the Second World War and still continues to exist after the end of war, and maybe more importantly after the socialist revolution that took place in this region. Secondly, it's an organization that on the one hand participated in the construction of socialist, Yugoslav socialist society and on the other was dealing with women's emancipation and liberation. So I believe that today we need to consider the history of Apoge by focusing on two important and of course mutually related questions. First question is, uh, is socialist project per se enough for abolishing patriarchal uh, relations and for achieving women's liberation? And if the answer is no, a uh, second question would be what can be learned from Apoge experience and be used in today's context in order to invent, to invent some successful form of organizing for women's style. I would like to begin with a very short overview of Apoge's history in order to put things in their context and to introduce those who don't know very much about the subject before I start analyzing it so I could answer to, to those two mentioned questions. Anti-fascist front of women, Apoge, started working already in the first year of the Second World War. Many of its members were already activists before, and many of them came from the youth section of an older women's Yugoslav organization called Women's Movement, and were members of the Yugoslav Communist Party that was illegal at the time. 
There are two important reasons for forming another women's organization, and I will just state them here. I, I will not go into details. First reason is that uh, while during the uh, 30s it was possible for communist women to cooperate with and within this older, often very liberal and maybe perhaps bourgeois organization, gathering around the struggle for women's right to vote, the situation changed, but it became obvious that the war will start. While women from this older movement believed that there are some bigger events going on the world scale and that it is not the right time to pose women's question, young activists that came from the Communist Party believed exactly the opposite. Women are and should be able to participate in those life and world-changing events. The second reason is, of course, that at the very beginning of the war, practice proved them right. Their role in the war was not only possible, but soon became necessary. In this talk, I will not focus on women's role in the war. I would just like to emphasize, to emphasize one important point. Due to many different reasons and causes that I don't have time to talk about here and now, uh, women's participation in the war and their crucial role in it made them equal within the national liberation struggle. They participated on an equal level in the struggle as men did. They were elected as leaders of partisan boards. They had an equal right to vote and so on. The important thing to remember is that this equality wasn't only a formal one. It was a real equality enjoyed by women in the struggle every day. It is also worth mentioning that shortly before the Second World War, women's organization that was gathered around the youth section that I mentioned was the biggest political movement in Yugoslavia at that time. When the war started, they, they made their, uh, their objectives very clear uh, to participate in the national liberation struggle and, not less important, to work on women's liberation question. I will now shift to the period after the war and try to mention some important roles that were assigned to FG. We need to take into account the situation that Yugoslavia was in, uh, in it at, that, at that moment. The war was over and it left the country devastated. There was no food, no clothes, almost 300,000 of children lost their parents and so the country has to be rebuilt from the ashes. Avija took the role of uh, what we call today social services. It was a well-organized, partly centralized organization, very familiar among the people, who had the power to mobilize female popula population in huge numbers. Its objective shifted only a little from those during the war time. First, women were needed to participate in building the social society, and second, although the new state formally accepted and legally introduced form of gender equality, it was at the time considered that women should have their own organization that wouldn't be separate from the state, but still would have some autonomy in dealing with women's question. And back then, women's question meant a lot of different things. Emancipation, literacy, political education, entrance into the public sphere, entrance into the sphere of wage work, education in terms of motherhood, and so on and so forth. Women were also a huge labor force that had to be used. Central Committee of Communist Party of Yugoslavia wrote a letter in 1945 that put a stop on this question whether that uh, autonomous women organization should exist, exist or not. And uh, the letter gave support to APG and stated that it was an integral but not subordinate part of the National Front. The main, uh, the main political organization at the time. In that way, at least for some time, women were, were able to stay the subjects of their own emancipation. Things changed in 1950, and the Third Congress of Apogee in October, they changed their own status. They, they remained a women's organization, but they became a section within the National Front, which brought a new division of labor. Women should deal with specific women's problems, and work of political and cultural emancipation of women should be passed to the organs of the National Front. The question of the necessity of existence of an autonomous, uh, autonomous women's organization started to be posed again. Many different theories were formed within the public opinion. Because of the macroeconomic policy change, there were many cuts, facilities for childcare were closing, and many people got fired from work. The questions like, should women be workers at all, and shouldn't they stay at home and do whatever, whatever they are naturally supposed to be doing, and the like, were closed again. All the leadership of the party wasn't keen to support these views, and at the moment it became obvious that they were starting to spread among other politicians and also the people. Many leaders of Apoge were also aware of these tendencies. At the 6th Congress of the League of Communists of Yugoslavia, an organization that replaced the Communist Party that took place in 1952, 
Avogad's leaders were posing this question and insisted that, and now I quote Vida Tomšić, law that, laws that protect women and guarantee them equality weren't enough. Neither can they be the only condition for the realization of, of their real equality. We would be mistaken, Vida said, if we believe that the road to full equality of women isn't full, full of objective and subjective obstacles, starting from the general backwardness, which is especially spread among countryside women, and the great burden they have to carry because of the house and family, to the wrong conceptions of women's position." And although communist leadership, including Alexander Rankovic and Tito himself, had supported them again, in the year to come, it slowly became obvious that something wasn't right and that things had to, had to change. Even the statistics, the statistics told the same. There were far fewer women in politics, literacy wasn't improving, although Afeshe did a great work on this question. There were new and new generations of young, young women who never learned to read and write, and with no public schools yet, it became impossible for Afeshe actives to do it by themselves alone. Children facilities were also closing and with introducing new child allowances, many women decided to give in to the pressures, give up their jobs and go back to the household. I will only take one more year into consideration, uh, a year 1953, and the Fourth Congress of Liberation, uh, Liberation Front that took place in January, when that organization both changed its name to Socialist Legal Working People, SSRN, and also changed its methods of work. Among other changes, it has been stated that Afeje has done really important work, but now the situation is changing and things have to change on that level as well. It was decided that the SSNR will, will form a special commission for working with uh, women, and Afeje accepted its new role that was reduced only to emancipation of countryside women and advancement of backward households, while all political, public and cultural work with women would be left to SS and NRS uh, new commissions. Not long after that, in September the same year, APJ had its own congress when it was decided, after a long and very exhausting debate, that it will deactivate itself. Explanation for that decision was that existence of autonomous women somehow makes it looks like women question is isolated from the society as a whole, and that it leads, of course, to separation within the working class uh, well known now. Uh, it is really important to note that many Afeje activists and delegates at the Congress felt angry about this decision and some of them uh, prote protest protested. When it was clear that there was no turning back, many boards were abolished and many activists just became passive and excluded themselves from their politics as such. But that wasn't the only reaction. Another one came from the women in lower classes and especially those in villages. They were really annoyed and disappointed with this resolution and you could often hear them speak about those great times where they had politics sessions, literacy lessons and so on. Usual re reactions were men have the party to debate politics and they have uh, taverns to spend fun time at and now we have nothing. With this, I would like to finish this historical part of speech to which I believe it was necessary. And since, I, since it has already taken me more space than I planned, I, I, I would like to proceed to the analysis. Uh, there will be three lines of analysis and three points I would like to make accordingly. All of them are attempts to answer the first and partly the second question I posted at the beginning of the talk. They will only be provisional and uh, we can follow them uh, with the discussion. First point that I would like to make is related to the tension that we can come across when we analyze the relation between AFG as a women organization and the different socialist organizations. It's a tension or maybe even a contradiction between the class question and the women question. To explain and illustrate it, I will use the already mentioned uh, child allowances measure as an example. When this measure was introduced, it was all also social sensitive. Richer families were supposed to get less money and poorer ones more. It depended on families' other incomes. From class perspective, this made a lot of sense. But when we consider it from women's perspective, it is not only that this measure by itself had an impact on women to choose to give up their jobs and go back to the housework and childcare work, but it did it unequally. It was primarily women from lower parts of the working class who made such a decision, which was devastating when you consider that exactly those women were at the same time also the most excluded from the public sphere, mostly illiterate, uh, prevented from politics, etc. 
If we don't have a women organization that can point at aspects like this one and will argue for some different solutions, like perhaps a de a demand to build more public kindergartens and schools, you will have bad consequences like this one. On the other hand, uh, from Afish experience, we can see that the relation of women's organization and socialist organization cannot be a relation between the particular and the general. As I hope it was clear from my uh, historical account, one of the main problematic tendencies was the one of the specialization, that is the process in which Afish stopped being women's organization for socialist struggle and was becoming <coughs> women's organization for women's question. The second point that I want to address is that from the beginning it was clear for everybody, and not just Afege, but also for the leadership of the party, that the problem that caused difficulties lay elsewhere and not in Afege's form of organization. The problem was patriarchy, and patriarchy is not only a question, but in truth it is related to the form of the whole society. To the form of the whole society. The resistance to women's liberation wasn't coming only from women, and I hope this won't sound too essentialist, but it was coming mostly from men, and not ju just from the so-called common men, but also from the members and leaders of the party, and a good example for that would be uh, my favorite, Nila uh, Vangelis. APG was a woman organization whose members were only women, and whose target group was women only except for the different proclamation and declaration that were coming from some of the uh, some members of the party leadership, especially Tito. On the organizational level, there was no concrete, concrete work with men on this question. Although the law was propagating a form of equality between the sexes, uh, practice showed that it was far from full equality, even far from equality that some women gained during the war time and due to some objective circumstances. It is precisely patriarchy that reduces the question of gender equality to the question uh, concerning exclusively women. So maybe we can conclude that it is not enough to have women-only uh, organization, even though it is necessary for a time, but that men must also be a part of this project and process. If we don't organize concrete field work and make men not only passive observers that simply listen to the directives even though they don't understand them and mostly don't agree with them, but to make them actively participate with women in the struggle that in the end is not only a struggle for women's emancipation but for the community as a whole. And thirdly, and that's the third point that is also uh, closely connected to the first two points, is the question of nuclear family. Even though women gave, gained many family law rights uh, that, that they never had before, like an absolute right to divorce, the right for extramarital children to be recognized, and in 70s uh, abortion rights, nuclear family as a model was never questioned. Quite to the contrary, it was often represented as a good model that should not be threatened more. In the example of child allowances, we can also observe another peculiar thing. At the moment when women's economic freedom should have been raised before, because of supplementary funds they acquired, when in fact, what in fact happened is that it diminished. In fact, they returned to providing non-wage reproductive labor within the nuclear family. In trying to make sense of this process, we have stumbled upon a crucial question. Why was it that amongst many different possible processes that could be initiated at this point, it was precisely the return of women to the sole function of reproductive laborers that imposed itself? My thesis would be that uh, the persistence of the nuclear family and the unwaged female domestic labor, even within the nominally socialist society in Yugoslavia, was a con consequence of the historical fact that wage labor in its modern form, and it's important to see modern form, uh, only ever asserted itself as the dominant form of labor after the socialist revolution. Before Second World War, Yugoslavia was a backward and agrarian country, and it became a modern industrialized country only with socialism. That included the, the development of modern forms of wage labor with all the contradictions that process involves, including the, the, the domestication, of, uh, domestication of the activities necessary for the production of labor power. This process was, of course, not the same as in capitalist modernization, but showed some disturbing, dis disturbing similarities. From the experience of APG and the gender uh, question in general in Yugoslavia, we can learn that developing socialism mean, means a lot more than nationalizing the economy and creating full employment for workers, which still remain 
wage workers. The wage form, is, the wage form always has its consequences, and one of, the, of them is that it sometimes puts the gender and class emancipation at odds with one another. These contradictions were not solved in historical socialism and remained urgent tasks for any attempts in the future. Also, to conclude, the question of separate women's political organizations remained open. Many Orthodox Marxists and Socialists would insist that separate <coughs> women's organizations not only serve to disarticulate the common class interest of the United Proletariat marching ahead into a glorious socialist future. But what if the women's question is not merely a slight disturbance in such glorious march, but a necessary aspect of full theoretical and political understanding of the methods and the goals of class emancipation itself? Separate women's organization are in that case necessary in order for women's question to not be automatically subsumed under supposed to be more urgent and important political goals but never separate in a sense that would understand women's question as a completely independent, independent and unrelated to all other issues of full political and social emancipation. Difference in unity of the women's question is a political puzzle that was historically suspended by the dissolution of AFG and still remains to be solved. student of sociology at the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences in Zagreb and a member of the Organization for Workers' Initiative and Democratization. Um, she is currently doing research on precarious work and social inequality in post-socialist countries. And the paper she will present, uh, will, uh, she will present the, uh, the research on economic position of women in ex countries. Uh, well, thank you for the invitation. And uh, first, I would, like, I would like to clarify the title of my paper. Uh, so I wrote uh, uh, ex-Yugoslav states, but I meant uh, post-Yugoslav states, if uh, anyone uh, has <laughs> doubts about that. Or today, uh, we can say Southeastern uh, European countries. Uh, but I will not provide the data for uh, all of the Southeast uh, European countries, but mainly for Croatia and sometimes for Slovenia, Serbia and Macedonia. Uh, so I was authored um, uh, to take on either a more empirically oriented approach uh, on transformations of gender relations in post-socialist era, or alternatively a more theoretical one, which would examine the relationship between class and gender. Uh, my paper will be empirically oriented, but I will also try to show that gender and class are uh, inseparable categories. Um, so regarding the link uh, between gender and class, uh, I will start with um, one tendency of the modern left, noticed by some contemporary feminists. So uh, there's a tendency um, of the new modern left to be uh, politically correct and to acknowledge the women's question, uh, unlike in previous decades in the 20th century when uh, the traditional left uh, often assumed an automatic transformation of gender relations uh, after the revolution. So this new modern approach, uh, which is politically correct, um, uh, acknowledges the <laughs> importance of women's question, uh, but it uh, usually leads to taking over of some of the liberal concepts, like quotas for women in the party, or um, using feminine grammatical forms if a language allows that, and so on. And then these uh, liberal concepts are added to the traditional leftist economic or political program, which remains unchanged itself. So, in order to change that, uh, the economic position of women in Southeast European countries and elsewhere uh, needs to be empirically examined to see what are the material difficulties of, uh, that women are faced with today. So, the data that will be shown uh, here today is uh, or actually a work in progress, which I have just started these days and it will be published later, so this overview will be a very incomplete. Um, but what can we do? So, uh, before the empirical part of my paper, I will just briefly point out some of uh, the theoretical foundations of what we could call a leftist feminist uh, or socialist feminist approach. Uh, so the key contribution of Marxist feminism uh, is pointing out the lack of Marxist analysis of the reproduction of the workforce. 
So this is the picture from uh, Lenin's book. Um, okay, let me stay here and I will uh, go on. Uh, so Marxist approach to class uh, has been uh, and is productivist. So uh, that means prioritizing productive labor, while for a complete understanding of the way that uh, capitalism works, some notions uh, should be expanded, uh, in particular social reproduction. Uh, it needs to include care work, or the work which enables the workforce to work. Uh, whether that care work is publicly provided, or as a paid service on the market, or unpaid in the household. So the fact that women are usually the ones who are doing the major part of uh, the unwaged care work has nothing to do, uh, when we say reproductive work, with their anatomical or biological differences, but it has to do with uh, the organization of care work in uh, capitalism and its uh, ideology. Uh, socialist feminism and Marxist feminism has done important work on the category of unwaged domestic labor uh, by situating its historical origin in the rise of industrial capitalism, which created a division between production and reproduction and has led to uh, devaluation of the labor uh, outside the market or the unwaged work uh, labor. So this was the theoretical short intro and now um, the economic position of women in post-socialist countries. So uh, already in the 1980s, uh, Southeast European countries experienced uh, rising unemployment uh, high inflation and a decrease in real wages, but only after the breakup of Yugoslavia, the new successor states uh, have followed the neoliberal pattern of integration uh, fully, and they introduced anti-inflationary stabilization program with the support of the International Monetary Fund, and started the economic restructuring process. As a result, the, uh, these countries have experienced severe transition crisis, which resulted in high unemployment, low employment rates, and uh, this also pertains to the so-called uh, successful uh, transition states of uh, Central and Eastern Europe, Euro Europe uh, as well. So, but also after that initial transition shock, uh, all these post-socialist countries are still bearing the costs of integration into unregulated uh, capital markets, which is pretty evident uh, today uh, during the crisis. So apart from unemployment, uh, during the post-socialist uh, transition, uh, social inequalities have deepened. So on the next slide we can see uh, the rise of the Gini coefficient from the beginning of uh, the transition. So this picture is for uh, Central uh, and East European countries, but in Southeast Europe uh, the Gini coefficient has been rising and it is uh, now about 35% in Croatia and Slovenia in Serbia and 43% in Macedonia, but a more intuitive indicator uh, for the inequality is the ratio of income held by highest 20% and the lowest 20%. Uh, so the income held by uh, highest 20% is about 40% 40, uh, 40 of income and in Macedonia even higher. Okay, and on the next slide you can see the ratio of income uh, held by uh, the lowest 20%. Um, so inequality uh, is pretty high and during the uh, transition, uh, transition and until today there has been an expansion of poverty and material deprivation and the negative social effects of market reforms are today more evident than ever. Uh, regarding the risk of poverty, Croatia is currently the third among European Union uh, member states. Uh, yes. uh, the specific groups which uh, have the highest risks of poverty are unemployed persons, uh, one parent families, and in 97% uh, uh, the parent is a woman, uh, retired persons and persons older than 65 years, uh, among which women who live alone are at a particularly high risk of poverty. So on the next uh, slide we can see uh, expenditure class uh, and the lowest three categories are, uh, so this blue line shows us the percentage of uh, female-headed households by expenditure class. So we can see that the households with lowest expenditure per month are female-headed. Um, concerning the labor market outcomes, a group of authors have coined the term dependent market economies for Southeastern Europe. Uh, and uh, among them, uh, they uh, divided, it, uh, divided them uh, on dependent industrialization, which uh, pertains to Slovenia, and dependent uh, financialization uh, for Serbia, Croatia, and Macedonia. 
So the fragility uh, of these countries became even more evident after the current crisis, which has exposed regional macroeconomic instability due to the appreciation of the local currency and fragility in respect to capital flow reversals. As Osman Monaran has shown, transition model based on private foreign direct investment flows uh, does not generate domestic spillovers uh, without the systematic industrial policy for uh, structural change and public investment. So the results were uh, uh, jobless growth and deindustrialization. But unlike in the developed countries, deindustrialization in Eastern Europe has led to low skilled and low paid uh, service jobs. So with the introduction of market reforms, Southeast European countries have experienced uh, the fall of the share of industry in GDP. Currently in Serbia, Croatia and Macedonia, it, uh, uh, the share of industry in GDP is around 30%. And the big job loss in industry, which initially affected more men than women, because they were concentrated in metal industry engineering. Um, also, these countries have experienced rise of uh, the share of services in GDP. So currently it is around 70% of GDP and employment, uh, as you can see in the next uh, graph, in uh, services has risen, especially women's employment. So data here is shown for Croatia, but the situation is very similar in Slovenia, Serbia and Macedonia. I'm sorry, I didn't have the time to translate the graph. So this is the share of uh, labor force in services uh, from 1991 uh, till 2010. The red line represents women's employment, uh, the blue line men's employment, and uh, the black line overall rates of employment in services. Um, so, uh, to explain, in order to explain the high poverty rates and uh, low uh, income of female-headed households as well as lower pensions, uh, we need to uh, consider the main and currently most popular indicator of gender inequality, and that is uh, pay. Uh, these are pay differentials between uh, women and men, or the so-called gender wage gap or gender pay gap. So on the next uh, slide, we can see um, one picture from uh, Europe Commission's document. So these percentages. You can see them, uh, they uh, signify the difference between women's and men's average uh, wage. So uh, it is very usual to uh, read articles uh, which say that women earn 70 cent cents for every dollar a man does and so on. Uh, in Croatia and Serbia the average uh, pay differential between genders is around 10% right now and in Macedonia and Slovenia it is lower and around 5% but uh, the main point of that is that uh, this of course makes very little sense since average should be used only for normal distributions which is not the case with the wage distribution so if there are any doubts about that we can see on the next slide the wage distribution of Croatia uh, so the data for this comes from the International Social Survey Program, uh, which is based on a representative sample, and so uh, uh, we have to bear in mind that there is a chance of statistical error. So uh, the distribution is very asymmetric on the left side, and uh, wages are here shown in uh, Croatia's currency, not euros. Uh, and the median wage on the next slide is, as we can see, uh, much lower than the average wage, and uh, here we have median wage uh, wages uh, from 2009 for Croatia and Slovenia and we can see the differences between uh, men and women and those differences uh, tend to be statistically significant. Uh, so it, it doesn't mean that women have uh, higher wages if the wage gap is smaller because their wages are expressed only as relative to men's average wage without considering the absolute wages. Uh, so we can uh, go back to the, the map from European Commission. Uh, so uh, I think in Romania there's pretty low uh, gender wage gap and in, I don't know, in some developed countries like um, Scandinavian countries the, the wage uh, gap is uh, pretty high. But that of course doesn't mean that uh, women's position in Romania is better in any way than women's position in Scandinavia. Um, for example, in the American labor market, the gender pay gap is closing, which is praised as a sign of progress in mainstream media, but as some economists have shown, this isn't happening because women's wages are rising, but only because men's wages are falling faster than women's wages, uh, which are also falling. Or another example, in the socialist era, the gender wage gap was comparable to levels found in the advanced capitalist countries, 
but uh, considering the narrow or wage distribution of socialist uh, countries, uh, this meant a lower gender gap than in societies with wider distributions, of course. Uh, but maybe the main reason uh, why average pay differentials are, um, in my opinion, a meaningless indicator is that the logic behind it is comparing all women with all men, as there were no class divisions among men and among women themselves. And uh, Italian feminist author Cinzia Arusa uh, calls this approach uh, gender without class approach. So among women, uh, no, among liberal economists and sociologists <laughs> who see uh, linear progress in gender relations. Uh, there is another uh, very popular indicator, uh, and that is the share of women in professional, managerial and related occupations. Uh, we, we have a picture for um, uh, dentists, physicians and lawyers, and uh, uh, architects, doctors and so on. So uh, they are very happy to announce that uh, the, the wage of women in those occupations uh, is rising from the 70s. Uh, and uh, oh, this, this graph is not for post socialist countries, but for, uh, I think, uh, Western Europe. Um, of course, this is a success for some women, and it shouldn't be downgraded, but the problem is that the limits of this success uh, are rarely stressed, and this success is, of course, partial, as we will see uh, later. Uh, the majority of women uh, today in post socialist countries work in services and are concentrated in occupations with below average median wages such as uh, retail, hotels and restaurants, uh, primary and secondary education, and healthcare. Uh, and in those occupations, the uh, wages are usually lower and the gender wage gap uh, higher than uh, average. So, um, as inequality became higher with introducing market reforms uh, and the wage distribution became wider and uh, more asymmetrical, uh, wage inequality between those with high school degrees or less and those with advanced education uh, began to rise. Uh, so on the next slide we can see um, uh, the difference between uh, women's median wage uh, by their uh, education level. So women with higher secondary education or lower levels of education have much more, uh, have much lower median wages than uh, women with advanced uh, education and this, uh, uh, this uh, difference also is st statistically significant. Um, and uh, so, in other words, uh, during the transition, a greater class divide among women workers has emerged, uh, and also, of course, among men. Uh, and only a small, a small part of women got significant gains, while precisely the opposite happened for the majority of women. Uh, although women comprise today a majority of college, uh, college students, uh, this still represents only a minority of all women, as we can see on, in the next uh, picture. Uh, so among all employed women, 80% uh, have uh, higher secondary education or lower levels, levels of education, and only about 20% of women have advanced uh, education in Croatia and Slovenia in 2009. Uh, so, uh, Although stressing those differences among women is important, uh, only doing that would again leave us with reducing gender uh, to class and it leaves an important question unanswered. And that question is, uh, why are women's median wages lower than men's and why are women, or majority of women, often employed in low paid occupations? And why are even the successful women uh, in a worse economic position than men of the same uh, economic category? Uh, social category. To illustrate the second point, uh, there is an interesting concept of lifetime gender wage gap. Although some groups of women have been uh, able to achieve much higher wages than the average in the past couple of decades, they too tend to lose significant income throughout their child rearing years. Uh, so the monthly or hourly gender wage pay ratio may be around 77%, but the lifetime gender gap, pay gap is much more substantial. So uh, in America, uh, in the United States, uh, uh, research showed that over their life course, women earn about 40% less when compared to men. Um, so in order to answer the post question, uh, I will first consider the mainstream answer to that, uh, which is, uh, of course, discrimination. So this mode of thinking is characteristic of neoclassical economics, uh, which has optimistic expectations of market reforms for improving women's economic status. And it is also characteristic of the post-socialist 
era uh, during which it became popular to replace class politics with identity politics. And uh, so the main explanation for gender pay differentials it is, is discrimination by employers who decide to pay women less than men uh, due to their traditional prejudice against them. In other words, the whole topic of gender economic inequality is shown as a result of traditional attitudes of individual bad employers and not a structural problem. And it also introduces a uh, men versus women kind of logic. Uh, there is no time now to uh, go into details, but uh, the neoclassical economics models for decomposition or for analyzing the gender wage gap are doing just that. They, they are trying to eliminate uh, the, all the structural differences in female and male employment, and uh, they are trying to adjust the gender wage gap to show that discrimination of individual employers against women is the only cause for the lower wages of women and the only thing that could be changed. Uh, well, increased employer discrimination against women is of course possible and likely after the state withdrew supports for uh, female employment which existed during socialism, but the reasons for discrimination should be put in another context. Uh, first of all, during the transition in Southeast Europe, uh, trade union density declined dramatically and the new private sector has been characterized by large uh, union-free spheres. Uh, so on the uh, next graph, we can see that the, the average uh, pay differential between men and women is uh, much higher in uh, the private sector than in the public sector in Serbia, Montenegro and Macedonia. Um, so um, whether or not employers are uh, predisposed to discriminate due to taste or prejudice, they may have increased incentives to discriminate, uh, discriminate against women if they perceive women as less uh, committed to work, more oriented uh, toward family concerns, or in other words, more likely to demand maternity and sick leave, which is in capitalism considered to be a cost. The competitive pressures of the market system and the withdrawal of state subsidies for maternity leave and childcare increased the costs uh, of hiring employees with such traits. For example, Simon Clark and Veronika Kabalina in Russia have interviewed managers in the post-socialist period and the managers said that business needs justified hiring men because female employees are less flexible and more expensive and thus they justified their reluctance to hire women following privatization. And uh, this is where the feminist Marxist theory of social reproduction should uh, come in. Uh, so I will uh, paraphrase the, the main uh, point of uh, text of the Endnotes Collective, The Logic of Gender, uh, and in which they say that we should denaturalize the gender fetish and see that in capitalism gender means essentially a price tag and that is the consequence of the basic logic of uh, capitalist accumulation. So costs of maternity leaves and relatively, dec uh, and relatively decreased productivity of female workers relative to men Men's productivity, uh, that is what makes them undesirable workers in sectors which require continuous investment in the so-called uh, human capital. And on the opposite, uh, this makes women a desirable workforce in low-skilled uh, occupations or occupations with low requirements for continu continuous investments in uh, further education and uh, this continuous pattern of uh, women's employment. So, in other words, the logic of capitalist production uh, and of socialized reproduction are incompatible. So, I will just uh, also paraphrase a colleague of mine, Judy Zadrgojevic, who has studied the creation example, uh, which has shown that inequalities in the, uh, in the time spent on household activities remain a key driver of the gender differences in participation in the labor force. And a lot of empirical evidence suggests that mothers of young children in Croatia and in most other countries as well, are taking longer, uh, longer maternity leaves and are disproportionately underrepresented at the labor market. Uh, one and the main reason for this is economic. Uh, so with, uh, in the absence of private uh, or public kindergartens available for children under three years of age, uh, women are often forced to uh, hire nannies in the informal economy, but since they are uh, not affordable to all but best paid women, Returning to work for working class women is uh, usually not an option. Uh, this leads to another important aspect of the economic position of the workforce uh, in general in the post-socialist countries, and that is the welfare state structure. 
Uh, although the Yugoslav successor states uh, manifested diverse trajectories regarding these issues, there are uh, common features. Uh, they all turn to the international financial institutions, uh, mainly the IMF and the World Bank, and their free market policy agenda, which also was reflected in the restructuring of social policy. Uh, so most of the social protection services, uh, for example subsidies for transport, food or housing, were eliminated during the transition as they were considered market distorting. Uh, social spending and public expenditure on health care have been shrinking and state institutions and policies that limited gender discrimination in the socialist era, for example, se uh, centralized wages, protective provisions in uh, labor law and state-provided maternity and child care benefits uh, have receded. Uh, during the socialist period, official socialist ideals and also labor shortages pushed women into the labor force uh, while state-sponsored child care and maternity leaves helped uh, women participate in the labor market. Uh, labor force participation of women in socialist countries uh, grew rapidly and has reached the same and in many socialist states higher levels than in the West. Uh, pregnant women's employment uh, was protected by law uh, and all women could count on support of state alongside paid mat maternity leaves uh, which have uh, ambiguous uh, consequences for women, as Andrea has shown. Uh, uh, women have leaves for sick children and at least in principle public kindergartens and schools offering day-long service. Uh, while there is a lack of data on the co uh, coverage of children by kindergartens or elderly and disabled people by institutions for elderly and disabled people, uh, there are some, uh, and this is um, a very important topic for further research, uh, there are some surveys of the distribution of housework among uh, partners and they show that women do much more housework than uh, their partners but those surveys are not mutually uh, comparable for several reasons and also they do not tell anything about the amount of housework today as compared with uh, in Yugoslavia. Uh, so in conclusion uh, the economic position of women deteriorates in the post-socialist economies due to change in, this sh in uh, the shape of overall wage distribution also and uh, rise in inequality and pursuing the neoliberal agenda in social politics which affects uh, the way social reproduction is organized. Uh, of course, improving access to the market and to better quality jobs benefit some individual women or some small groups of women, such as business women, but it simply redistributes the caring labor among other women and working class women are the ones who bear uh, the great share of that uh, costs, cost of care work. Uh, so uh, the main ideological obstacles for reconnecting gender and class in post-socialist states but in other uh, states as well is uh, framing the discussion about uh, the gender economic inequality in uh, uh, this gender without class approach. So, uh, for example, there is the book published in Croatia uh, about the pay differentials between men and women, published by a successful Croatian businesswoman, and it is uh, entitled, um, titled uh, Why Are We Paid Less? And it basically uh, comes down to self help literature for women to be more uh, brave and demand uh, higher wages and so on. And uh, this is not uh, an isolated uh, example. Uh, so this, uh, this is also apparent in official statistical agencies' approach to providing the data. Uh, so in order to, uh, to show the differences, the real differences in wages, I had to uh, uh, analyze the data of some uh, social survey program, but uh, official statistical agencies and European Commission uh, do not uh, publish anything about uh, the median wages among women in uh, different occupations, which would be uh, most, uh, the most important indicator of uh, the gender wage gap. Uh, and so this uh, gender without class approach uh, also uh, uh, is fresh uh, while putting stress on business women uh, who have some uh, troubles with combining family and uh, their jobs. So they are demanding flexible uh, work arrangements. Uh, although in southeastern European countries, uh, with the exception of Slovenia to some extent, uh, the part-time work arrangement uh, is not very widespread. There are some uh, right now. There are some uh, uh, new 
implementing policies which are trying to introduce that. So the flexible model of employment is uh, uh, legitimized as especially uh, good for women who need to combine their uh, uh, family and uh, jobs. So this uh, kind of thinking is also backed up by popular psychology which fills the mainstream media with articles about men being from Mars and women from uh, Venus or, uh, for example, evolutionary psychology uh, with its measurement of women's eye pupils which expand uh, when they see little babies and so on. So in the lack of political articulation of the, uh, the gender economic inequality, uh, these kind of articles uh, are an ideological influence on everyone who reads such material uh, because a lot of surveys uh, of uh, values towards, of attitudes towards women's employment show that the majority of people see, uh, don't see any problem with uh, women being at home taking care of children and uh, they consider it natural for women to uh, accept their status as secondary earners in the family. So, in conclusion, um, following the Marxist feminist theoretical framework from the beginning, uh, caring, care work or uh, domestic unwaged labor and its redistribution as a response to accumulation changes, changes should be of uh, high importance for a leftist analysis and political program. Uh, most women depend on caregiving facilities and also care workers <coughs> themselves are in need of unionization. So every left alternative, which by definition fights for a system that would be governed by people's needs, should recognize that women need collective solutions to market activity and non-market activity as well. Or in more theoretical terms, uh, the left should try to overcome the capitalist division between productive and reproductive labor, in which the latter is seen as natural or unimportant. Thank you. environment uh, with the accent on ma ma uh, male environment 
that push them to uh, do just women job, to do just uh, uh, to take care of women's problems, especially women's problems, and so on. And I, and I think it's a really rare example of that kind of a thing. But uh, we really need. Uh, the, the, I, I also believe that uh, the, the the reasons why even some how to say educated and uh, emancipated ma uh, male members of the party. Uh, uh, taught what they taught uh, is because uh, they didn't actually do uh, field work with those women. Because they uh, often uh, would say that um, uh is being slowly organized, it has to change, um, they're not uh, coming to the enough move, uh, women, they're not doing uh, good the political work, work, so the National Front should take it on itself. And uh, it was because they, I believe, they didn't have a knowledge. Uh, to, to understand how uh, actually Hart was doing that. I mean, it's, it's the first time that uh, those women were, were really going into uh, private sphere and intimacy of, and village home, I don't know, stuff to Serbia, for example. And it's, it, it was really hard. It, it had to be slow, but they didn't understand it, I believe. And that's why they simply said, okay, you're not doing it uh, fast enough, we will take that, and they never continued. I have something to say, but I don't know if that will answer the question. <laughs> um, I, I like the, the, the thing that Andrea uh, talks about in uh, stressing that the modern, uh, how do you say, modern wage form emerged in Yugoslavia, uh, and so there wasn't any analysis of the structural importance of uh, the unwaged labor of women. So. Uh, with, alongside with that and uh, many other reasons, uh, we shouldn't be so uh, surprised uh, about uh, the, the amount of housework done by women in Yugoslavia. Uh, well, there are no um, uh, surveys on uh, that. Uh, I found uh, one article uh, which was uh, based on a survey done in, I, I think, 87 by American economists and sociologists, which uh, analyzed the impact on, of the work status and the marital uh, status of women on their share of housework. So uh, they, this is not, uh, as I uh, mentioned in my uh, talk, uh, we cannot compare this with the uh, service done today, but um, they also did um, much more housework than their partners. Uh, but yeah, as I said, it would be a very, uh, it would be much more, uh, um, important to, to uh, compare the amount of housework done in Yugoslavia and Croatia, so I cannot say anything about that, but uh, we have some uh, incidental uh, uh, data on that, and uh, I think that even today uh, this uh, women's question, I mean the, the, the term itself, uh, shows that this is uh, viewed as, as something which concerns only women, and of course we should uh, deal with that and so on, but uh, the, the, the main theoretical analysis of the reproductive work should be denaturalized, which means uh, that we shouldn't uh, look at it as something that women do, uh, because it, it has nothing to do with their, um, I don't know, biological uh, difference from men, but it's uh, uh, this category of unwaged work is a category which emerged with uh, capitalism. So I think that is the... Um, the theoretical part, which is still lacking in um, leftist and analytical programs today. Okay, uh, maybe another point. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, uh, the question of uh, uh, inter family. So, uh, could you clarify your positions in that? It is, is there any, I mean, I mean, is the women emancipation possible within the nuclear family in this current form or how big with the transformation has been? I believe that uh, it could be some emancipation by some point, but not full. And uh, I, I stated here, here already uh, that when, uh, uh, from this analysis, the nuclear family is a precondition to uh, this kind of wage labor when uh, the reproduction falls into women, into, uh, I want to represent that, into uh, existing capitalist society. So uh, uh, the form of emancipation will be possible uh, without the abolition of the nuclear family, as we know it. Well, it depends 
somehow we will find the nuclear family. Uh, and I, I, I don't, I'm not particularly uh, fond of the uh, some of the Marxist feminist analysis of the uh, connection between the nuclear family and capitalism. Of course, it uh, coincided in the. Uh, uh, Okay, it, uh, it happened at the same time, uh, and it of course served important functions in the capitalist economy. Uh, but to look at it in this over determinist way uh, is not helpful because, uh, well, I think it depends on how we define uh, nuclear family. So if we, for example, imagine a fully socialized uh, care work, uh, so I think that in that scenario uh, the 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 fact that the sexual relationships should be based on the same basis as today uh, wouldn't be such an obstacle for um, women's emancipation. Or maybe it would uh, disappear, I don't know. I don't think men in the crowd take you seriously enough. Uh, no, seriously, I mean, we could ask a lot of questions. It's a bit embarrassing that I always have to ask a question on their silence. So, yeah, I'll tell you later over here. Uh, but the question to Andrea, social services, the role of RPG. Uh, I mean, in Marxist literature, there is a concept of social wage. Uh, probably the best source is Anwar Shaikh, uh, his work with him. It's done since the 70s, but there's plenty of people who wrote on this, uh, calculating the, what the state provides for public goods as an additional, uh, as, 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 a, as a wage, which is the other wage that you get in your uh, place of employment for a wage labor. So, uh, have you looked at all how, uh, what, what role Alphage played as a delivery of services or outputs that were meeting the needs? And how that changed once that, that shut down, once that stopped happening. I mean, what, what took on those roles? Like you said, activists stopped being active. But then, what was not being solved, which needs were not being met, met, which were met before, and how is that met differently today when a capitalist state creates uh, social services to kind of roughly deal with those needs? Because these are two different logics, one from the post you know, socialist post Second World War, uh, a push, and, and what we see in, uh, in uh, uh, the so-called transition. And the question for Dora is, uh, I mean, I know exactly what you're saying, and I know, I know your uh, literature that you're using, but because you use a lot of wage gap, and you talk about wage, the more wage we get, the more we rely on commodities, the more production is monetized in terms of our and I mean, workers receiving more and more money for the service, of course, they have to go and get services for what they need. So, is it, don't you think that you're using too much wage cap as a point of focus? Do you think you're falling into... Well, I'm using a, a, in, in your presentation, it's just wage gap. Wage gap is very ah, present. Wage, yeah. we've, we've heard wage gap <laughs> 10 times. But then we've heard very little about if you want, yes, exactly, total, total social cost of reproduction. I mean, what, you know, like you said, you had, there's no coverage. I actually looked at this in the UK. There's, there's hardly any coverage on data on kindergartens and elderly care per area. So you can get it in a total national coverage, but it's not just not good enough because you can't compare the quality of living. You can't compare, you can have a class analysis either. So... Too much weight. Yeah, too, I mean, too much wage that puts you in the same bracket of, at least, you know, me listening to you, you know, I'm thinking, okay, is this a liberal approach? I know you're not doing it, but, you know, if, if we equalize wages, these women will go and buy those services, which will be on market, they will not be provided, so I don't think that equalizing the wage on its own solves the problem, which you know, but... I don't think that it does. Yeah. So I, I, I would just like to hear more your views on the other end, which is state providing according to need.
social services uh, even during the war because uh, there were many hungry soldiers and many wooden soldiers and they needed any kind of help and when you look at the data it's really enormous numbers of actions that they actually did uh, from I don't know, collecting the food to collecting some uh, funny things like boots but they can uh, make a, a decision between life and death in the wartime and uh, when, uh, of course medicine you know, and when the war ended they continued doing that and precisely three points first was taking care of the children as I mentioned there was 300,000 of children without, with no parents and uh, uh, so they were uh, a devastated country they had no food in uh, 1945 uh, they had a problem with There was no food, that's the point, there was no bread. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they needed to uh, actually, um, uh, I, I don't know how to say, uh, somehow find a way to invent uh, 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 ways to produce food in that kind of uh, state. And of course they kept providing medical services to, uh, to the soldiers and to the children. And there were a lot of uh, disease back then also because uh, of the post-war war So So okay, like in the first uh, three years or three to five years after the war, they did all the job. And um, after that, they even uh, were the first ones who started building uh, child facilities uh, before the state did it because in the first years there, there were no money for that. It was like it was only their job. So they actually connected money from international organizations and they uh, built the first facilities in the kindergartens and um, they did it only by the uh, 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 hours and hours of never paid work and uh, uh, but at some point when uh, the state somehow got to its leg uh, at least a bit uh, they started uh, working with AFG on this question but uh, it was during, I'm not sure, uh, 49 until uh, 52, that uh, there was a little crisis and uh, um, there was no money. At least they said they had bigger issues to deal with, like building the factories and so on, which really at some, at some level had sense. So they cut uh, the things they started working on and then it again fell on the uh, back of the Afasia organizations that had actives for every uh, kind of questions, uh, with questions about, uh, I don't know, in some village too many babies are dying per year, they have to find a way to educate those women to take care uh, of that babies and, and so on, until questions like men are uh, uh, beating their wives, so they need to organize and then you have three, uh, uh, three uh, uh, female comrades knocking on the door and, uh, middle of the night, don't you do that, uh, committee to said it's forbidden, you will go to the jail and then uh, if he would do it again, they would really go to the jail and so on. So they were even kind of government police back then. So yeah, a lot of social services. Okay, if it wasn't uh, clear enough, uh, I showed the data on the wage gaps in order to criticize that approach and uh, to show that uh, the main reason for women's uh, lower wages compared to men's is their structural position in capitalism, which is different on the labor market and outside of it in the sphere of unwaged domestic labor. So my uh, view on that question is, of course, that uh, women need the socialized uh, uh, care work uh, and the equalizing of wages would not lead to that. That's obvious. That's not what I uh, tried to say. Um, yeah, that's it. If I understood the question. I, I, um, uh, I, I wasn't mentioning the, the wage gap uh, because I think it's bad that women have lower wages and the, the, the wage should uh, rise so that women can uh, buy services from other women on the market. That's precisely what I criticized in the other part of my talk. Um, uh, uh, my question would be about, uh, earlier you said, view comrade on the right, uh, you said that emancipation within nuclear family is uh, possible only to a certain extent. 
Now, uh, oops. Uh, now there is a problem that uh, uh, if you look at the recent events concerning uh, the nuclear families, there have been a various campaign about uh, uh, protecting the nuclear family, uh, particularly in Croatia and Slovenia. And uh, nuclear families have uh, often they have. Uh, Really, the dispute uh, <coughs> connotation of something uh, divine, uh, morally uh, upgraded, as uh, as uh, and generally, I, I mean, nuclear families uh, emphasize in one way or another a sort of a wholeness of of a woman. So my question would be here: uh, How do you see? I mean, to to what exactly, certain extent, do you see this emancipation in? in nuclear family. Well, I didn't think about it a lot, so... Um, well, to a certain extent that it's possible in capitalism uh, at all. I mean, um, they, you can make... Uh, uh, so, I, I, I'll take an example. Back in the uh, 50s in Yugoslavia, uh, the, one of the problems that was constantly uh, uh, repeating uh, were that uh, husbands wouldn't allow their wives to, I don't know, be elected uh, in their uh, cities or villages boards and uh, they didn't allow them to go to an alphabetic courses where they would uh, uh, be learned to read and uh, to write and so on and so forth. And I, I believe that today with this kind of um, liberal struggles that we all been through, uh, those kind of things won't happen. So you, you are uh, able to educate yourself and you can l uh, learn to write. But uh, uh, the question where it all falls fall, uh, down is uh, whether or not uh, housework is, is uh, uh, seen for, for first as work and second, uh, why, are, uh, why is that a woman's question and everything that you have spoken about? I mean, that's, uh, almost everything that she said was uh, criticizing that perspective. Uh, so, yeah, in a certain amount, but when you go behind those numbers, there is a huge problem and fallacy in analysis. Okay, another question. <coughs> okay, I have a question uh, concerning your conclusion, uh, Andrea. Uh, when you said that uh, there is an uh, absolute need of independent human organization in the political organization of party, I, I agree completely. And then you said there shouldn't be the relation of some general in particular. I also agree particularly. Um, I also agree strongly. Uh, but uh, do you know any kind of examples of ideas how this uh, would function in, in operative sense in terms of procedures of decision making, in terms of, of hierarchical structures, in the sense that there are no, you know, you have some leftist party and there are different factions, you know, women, uh, I don't know, Trotskyists, reformists, and you know, where uh, fans of game from So is, is there uh, some kind of example of idea how this should be implemented in a procedural uh, 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 sense, not only that the, the women uh, organization is just, you know, a watchdog will be comrades go, you know, we have some deviation, but in terms of structure, in terms of functioning. I know it's a difficult question just to, to uh, I don't have an example, sorry, for example, but I can analyze uh, what your question is very well because the, I didn't mention it in my uh, lecture, but uh, I forgot, but I will mention it now. That was the problem that Tafeja also had because they had this kind of a hierarchical connection to the party and to the other organizations, and yet itself was horizontal organized. You had leadership of the Afrika and so on, but uh, anyone could participate, uh, uh, anyone could go to the Congress, they uh, delivered about any question, and uh, it was like a horizontal type of organization, and they had a contradiction with uh, problems like, I don't know, they have to go to the Congress, and uh, usually the Congresses of Afrika were a few months after Congresses of National Front, and they will have to tell, tell those, those women our comrades said that, that, and that, and it would kind of um, uh, disturb the, the logic of their function with, where, where the, their, on, the, on their um, usual meetings now. So I don't have uh, an, 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 an explanation of that. It's, it's, it's about the equality because I believe that women should have, at least at the beginning, their own organization because many questions they really and practice show wouldn't be able to talk in front of men, particularly where you're working with uh, conservative 
regions. But uh, yet, uh, I also mentioned that men should be somehow included into this process, and I yet don't have any concrete answer to that. But it's really important. They should take care of the children. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, there are the meetings, I agree. Now, if there are no more questions, yeah, one more question. One, one more short mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, one more short question. Mm -hmm. Okay, speak up. Speak up. Okay, very, very short. Uh, can you imagine some, some, some kind of I know some new AFG, some kind of AFG for 21st century. Uh, do we need another world war for? <laughs> or, uh, uh, and uh, and second, uh, 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 what what's your opinion about uh, existing for, uh, forms of uh, uh, feminist organizing, let's say, in region, uh, last two decades, maybe? And I answer the second question. I don't want to do it in public. <laughs> 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 I'm just kidding. Um, uh, well, I, I believe that, yeah, uh, I, I believe that the significant and uh, the significant role that Afrija was able to have uh, 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 after the war uh, were due to actually Second World War, but not as a war, but their uh, necessary role in it. Because uh, you had a lot of, uh, like, uh, for example, in Serbia, uh, especially in Wallachia, you had a lot of the space that was just left empty. Partisans went into Bosnia and there did the struggles, and then you have a, a, a whole society, the elders and the youngsters, and uh, and just their houses and everything. They should be taken care of, and that is one of the the, the conditions. And uh, that is the first thing. And the second thing is. Uh, which is a consequence of the first. That as I, but as I said, even before the war, they were the uh, the the, mo the biggest uh, political organization in this. I, I don't think it's a very known fact. Uh, it was bigger than the communist organization, even though it, uh, it uh, its origin is in uh, those huge section of the communist party that uh, became. Um, so I don't know. I I believe. Yeah, you maybe you don't need such a radical break as the war. But you, uh, you, you need to do, you need to find some question to gather them. Like back then, that was question for vote, and then they. Uh, but I, uh, the the most important thing was the trust they had among women, uh, because they worked in daily uh, on daily basis uh, with them, and all sorts of women, city women, countryside women. Uh, the regions were different, of course. Vojvodina was uh, already a little bit emancipated. Then you have a problem with Kosovo, and then of course there were religion questions and so on. And, but they, they somehow managed to, to approach to all of them and really worked, as I said, daily daily basis with them during before the war, during the war, and especially after. Okay. Okay. Are you done? Because <laughs> I have another question. Yeah, hi. Uh, I'm sorry, I wasn't present all the time. We cannot see you at all. Maybe you could just speak to the system. Anita, yeah. hi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I sorry, I wasn't able to uh, listen through... It's a big bus. Come on, see me. Okay, hi. Um, I wasn't able to listen uh, through both of your lectures completely because I was outside, but that's why I'm going to, I think, follow up on Kostanich's question. At least indirectly, in the sense that I'm going to uh, pose a question of what do you think? Uh, uh, what do you think about quotas uh, in a socialist organization? Would they be uh, like a progressive move or not? Or are you uh, completely opposed, uh, regardless of the context, um, uh, opposed to quotas? That's my question. A concrete one. Uh, Okay, I, I, I can quote myself. Um, in the beginning I said that uh, the, the new uh, modern left, which acknowledges the, the woman question as important, uh, usually takes over some liberal concepts like quotas in the party without doing anything else. So that is the problem. Uh, so that's all. We can write our... Um, 
part of the party, the documents, party documents in feminine grammatical form, and maybe we can introduce some quotas for women, but if we do nothing else uh, alongside that, then I'm against, of course, I'm, 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 it doesn't matter if I'm against, that, that's not a leftist approach. Uh, but uh, if we uh, do some other things, like uh, uh, try to um, articulate women's problems, uh, such as care work, uh, the lack of public institutions for uh, children and elderly and so on, uh, then that's another question and of course uh, uh, there's nothing wrong, wrong with quotas in the party because uh, as we all know uh, women are uh, usually uh, not very prone for, to public speaking, to, uh, uh, they, they won't do it themselves without some kind of formal uh, push. So yeah, I'm definitely pro quotas in that kind of uh, context. Okay, I'd just uh, like to add a short comment on the quotas uh, uh, question. Of course, they're, they're positive in the sense that you mentioned, but they, um, the problem with quotas, there's another problem that they're essentially. So, for example, you just don't want to put um, female bodies in certain places of power or public visibility, because then you, uh, you can end up with Margaret Thatcher as your prime minister. I mean, she's of course a woman by this uh, traditional mainstream standard, but, it's, uh, uh, um, but, 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 was, but was opposed to any kind of pro-feminine or progressive or left-wing politics. So actually, from the perspective of the women's question, uh, it would be much better if there would be a, a, a male uh, left-wing uh, prime minister at that time at the, at the, as the head of the the state. So, so I think what is important is that the distribution of naively biologically defined gender bodies, but uh, how, how the socialist party or the movement shapes its politics to, uh, to be against conservative notions of family and gender relations and to be pro-feminine and progressive in general without so much regard of uh, physical, physiological characteristic of um, outer bodies of its members. But I wasn't talking. I wasn't talking about that level. I was talking about the level. Sorry, yeah, because I posed the question. Can I just uh, relate to that? I was talking about the level, the basic level of uh, uh, at the level of the organization. You start building a so-called it's nominally socialist organization. How do you deal with the fact that you have uh, more men than women in advance? First, uh, uh, not just in important positions, but uh, in general. And uh, that's why I introduced this, the, the idea of quotas, how could they be helpful? Because I think they could be helpful, at least, I mean, if not in a socialist organization, I don't know where. I wasn't talking about the next level when we come to, uh, to when once you come to the power, and, uh, to power and then what you do. That wasn't my point, so. So I didn't quite get your uh, argument, Dimash, maybe you could elaborate about, uh, about, doing, about, uh, about Thatcher doing uh, uh, a mistress. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> hey, we can all engage in discussion. <laughs> okay, I can. Uh, I would uh, like to quote uh, Andrea Milat now from her un unpublished paper, I think, uh, where she said that uh, the socialist uh, or leftist organization, uh, organizations should uh, recognize uh, the gender imbalances uh, among them in order to recognize them in wider society. So if we uh, put uh, a quota of, I don't know, 50% women in the party. We are not doing it because uh, women have uh, certain organs, but bec because we are aware of structural uh, um, okay. obstacles, uh, uh, which are the reason why they are, uh, I don't know, ashamed to talk uh, because they have those kind of experiences in college or wherever public speaking and so on. Mm -hmm.